and welcome to the first ever crash course of holy crap i need to learn some photography because i just got hired or i'm doing a bunch of cool stuff and i got some new cool gear so i have the fortunate uh ability to be able to teach this today um to one of my clients helpers workers and um we're gonna get right to it all right so we're gonna start at the top very top how does the camera see light okay so with the camera as i come over here off frame old camera right so i'm not gonna this is not a history test i'm not gonna go and way deep i'm just gonna give you the things right that you need to know so this is really an slr and then all of a sudden it was dslr for digital right well this camera sees light as reflective right so in other words a reflective light means i have a camera guy right here so here's my little camera right here you know my little camera my lens and here's a dude right here yay and then maybe behind it is a wall right so the wall okay so i have a wall and i have a camera and what this light meter inside this camera wants to see right here or it wants to see what we call um a balance like the middle point right and what i mean by that is reflective light is light that comes into the subject and bounces back to the camera okay that's called reflective light okay so you have a reflective light meter in every single one of these by default you can't have what we call an incident light meter an incident light meter is one of those handheld light meters that has a little dome on it right here and it measures the light falling on the subject so the little happy rays right here yay sun light falling on the subject right the camera doesn't do that a camera it's gonna measure all the light bouncing off this wall, coming back, bouncing off this the ground, coming back, whatever is in that scene, it's gonna be um, metered in the light. Now, cameras today have gotten a lot better about reflective light, but it's not a true representation of the shot. So if I had a white wall, okay, and I had a snowman, big ass snowman right here, check him out, yay. And this is the white wall, all right? And then there's a snowman, and my frame is right here, what I see in the camera, all white. Do you think what the camera sees would be an accurate representation of that light? No, that's correct. Because what the, what the camera wants to see, is it wants to see this. Let me get another marker here. It wants to see, I shouldn't say it wants to see it. it, it the, can the meter in the camera wants to average it out. It wants to average out the exposure, all right? So what the camera wants to see is a perfect square like this and half black, half white. So when it's half black, half white, that's a perfect exposure as a reflective camera back to coming to a camera, right? So when you have a snowman right here, you have to compensate for that in the exposure. So because this goes back to grayscale and black, um, I get really hung up on here, but I want to kind of move forward. So I'm kind of only going to touch upon these subjects, but not like be completely detailed and break it all down kind of a thing. But if this is the top and this is completely 100% white and zero is black like video, because a lot of shooters now do both, right? Your camera wants to see the middle, right? Wants to see the middle. And in photography terms, that's 18% gray. Just that would say what they reference, okay? So if my camera meter sees that white and I photograph that, and I got my little dials and stuff, and I took a photo, it's gonna actually come out gray. This will kind of come out like gray, as I spell that incorrectly probably. This will come out gray if you don't do anything. So you have to get into your manual settings and overexpose that shot because the value of all this stuff lies up towards the white side, it lies all right here. It's because it's a white snowman, it's white, all that, information on the exposure value ends up on the top side of the scale okay now let's just say i'm photographing this right here and i got a black huge shipping box on a black wall right and it's black the whole thing is black knowing that the camera wants to average it out the meter in the camera wants to make it say hey man i i know for a fact that harley every time Nobody's ever gonna really shoot a scene that's fully black. There's always gonna be enough white and black, it'll balance, I'll be able to meter it okay. You know, it'll just happen. That's what the camera's thinking inside of its head. It's like, ah, I got you, man. But then one day, 
you go to a jet black wall with a black box, you fill it up with hot sun, and you know what that sucker's gonna do? Well, overexpose or underexpose? Because it wants to see, that's correct, it'll overexpose. So this black will end up back to gray, right? Because white, you need to overexpose if you really wanna see white. And I don't wanna say overexpose, just you wanna expose properly, right? So that's what we're trying to get to when you have a reflective meter, right? So exposed properly with snowman on a white wall is different than a black box and a black wall, right? So now that you know what your camera actually meters, called reflective light meter, you know what you're getting into. So if you got a dark skin model and she's going on some, you know, black sequence and, and she's coming down with like a black waterfall with rocks, you know for a fact, you know for a fact, you're gonna have to underexpose that, right? Cameras are really good these days, and they're not as bad, but I'm, even like 90s, mid 90s, early 2000s, you have to remember that. And you still have to remember it today, but that's why they have exposure matrices and all that stuff today. I'm teaching an old school way. I'm teaching like no brain photography way. So if you wanna use the auto functions, that's great, and use them. I'm teaching you the theory and basics behind exposure and camera work. So if you know the theory and basics behind all this stuff, you'll be able to do a great job, all right? All right, so first little module is how a camera sees light. Okay, reflective. Now, if I had a light meter and I come here, right? Little light meter, which I have right here. This is called an incident, li an incident light meter, right? It measures what? The light falling on the subject. So whether it's here or here, I'm gonna know the right exposure, all right? That's why pros use light meters. You know, and you can always ha you can always be assured of the exact light, right? So if I do this and I go, oh look, it's f8, oh look, it's f8, it's f8, because it's a light falling, not reflecting. And it's going to render the white snowman correctly. It will render the black wall, the black box correctly with instant light meter. Now you know why they make these, right? Even today, and we'll come back to this when it comes to strobe time. All right, moving on. Is there any questions about reflective and incident? metering of, of your camera. All right, yay. We're moving right along. We're whizzing by this. Who needs to go to school you can just come here? That's right, great Marxy. All right, incident reflective. Okay, exposure correctly. All right, so what we have here is pretty much the heart and soul of all camera systems and how you manipulate them to give the exposure you want. Okay, so you have ISO, right? You have shutter, and then you have aperture. Aperture, we'll just read it there. I'm a horrible speller, so what up? So here we go. ISO is also sometimes referred to as ASA. We'll start here. Back in the days of film, film had a speed to it. And what they mean by speed is sensitivity of the actual emulsion of the film, okay? So back in the 50s, 60s, film had an emulsion like a 64 ISO, Kodachrome. Even to this day, some of the best film, if you can find it and shoot it, you should do it, it's cool. But that's a has-been kind of past. So a little tear forms up as they talk about Kodachrome 64. But 64 stood for the speed, super slow speed. You needed a lot of light to expose it, all right? So the ISO could go from 64 back in the day, and then 3200 was a huge drop for like T-Max film, right? So those are the two kind of ISO. And all this means is that more sensitive to light, less sensitive to light, right? Now, the other thing too is you have grain, we'll put a G, bigger, you have grain in your finished product, big grain here, and then you have what we call a uh, smaller grain. Now, in today's world, because you got all for emulsion, right? This, this equals noise now, okay? Noise. And we're, we won't get into the idiosyncrasies of noise, right? So now that you know between ISO and ASA, if in doubt, always try to shoot the lowest ISO. That it still holds true today, right? So if you're out and about, whatever, Try to shoot the lowest ISO if you can. You can't always do that, because that's why they always give you the option. But just know that if you're gonna go ISO, you're gonna increase your grain, if you're still shooting film, 
but no one is, maybe one, two people, or noise in your image, right? All right. Hey, thanks for checking out the video today. If you like what you saw, go ahead and give us a little bit of a like there on the little thumbs up -y. And if you're really interested in seeing more from Film Sandwich, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you're always updated every time we post a video. Also, we are currently an unsubscribed channel, so all the reviews here, everything that we do is all unpaid and comes out of our own pockets. So what we've done is we've put links to all the products that we review and use in our videos. And if you buy the products through those links, we get a little bit of ching ching so we can keep this channel going. So once again, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.